Hej alla och välkomna till det här seminariet som handlar om cybersäkerhet för aktivister. Det här seminariet kommer att hållas på engelska så jag kommer att ändra språk med, med detsamma. Hello everybody and welcome to the seminar which is about cybersecurity basics for activists. My name is Khaled Rashid and uh, I've worked with uh, several NGOs in uh, the last uh, few years. I've worked with RFSL, with Stockholm City Mission, and today I work with uh, UNH, uh, Sweden for UNHCR as an IT and digital digitalization strategist. Now, I'm going to give you an overview about what uh, this seminar is about, uh, but I will also say that I'm aiming to hold this seminar to 30 to about or 45 minutes. And I hope that there will be some questions or some interactions from the viewers. Uh, I mean, I do like my voice, but it gets boring in the long run. So if you get any questions or uh, thoughts during this seminar, you're very welcome to share them. So what you will get throughout this seminar is actually a few basic things to protect your cyber, uh, to, to protect your uh, your your uh, IT devices and get a acceptable level of cybersecurity. You will also be introduced to a concept called threat modeling. Threat modeling is. Uh, something like a checklist where you look at your things that you want to protect, look at which potential threats they are and how you can, what you can do in order to protect those precious things that you have. And lastly, I will also provide with resources for further reading because uh, cybersecurity is a vast area and we have only a little bit of time. So if for those who are curious and want to read more, they will be, uh, they will be provided with, uh, with that. And uh, of course, if someone wants to get in touch with me afterwards, they're most welcome. I will also mention what you won't get from this seminar. And you will not get 100% safety. 100% safety as a concept does not exist. And if someone or something offers you 100% safety, then you know they are charlatans. And the reason why there is no uh, one, something that's 100% uh, safety is that there is always some kind of vulnerability. And since this is a field that is constantly changing, what is secure today might be insecure tomorrow. And vice versa, what is insecure today could be secure tomorrow. So this is, some, so this is all about reducing re the risks to acceptable levels. I will also not mention privacy related issues. For instance, I will not talk about how to protect your Facebook profile or Instagram profile. Um, so, and I, uh, be, since I wanted to focus on cybersecurity only. However, you can apply some of the cybersecurity concepts to protect your privacy as well. And lastly, the physical aspect of security. You have to think about that if uh, you are trying to defend a server that you are running your emails from or that you are sharing files from and you have super duper cybersecurity mechanisms up and running, but it's running in a garage somewhere with uh, just a simple uh, lock, then that's uh, not enough security for your, uh, to protect your information. And uh, since this, this field is out of the scope of this seminar. I will not cover it. However, it is still an important field. So something to read further on uh, in the future for those who are curious. Um, yeah, so that's about it. And of course, uh, you will not become a double O agent by, doing, by participating in this seminar again, but you will be very, have a much better understanding of, of protecting your information yourself. So let's talk about why this is relevant for activists or for NGOs, for that matter. And if you look for the past 10 years, cyber warfare has gotten increased both in activity and in sophistication. And uh, as you can see here, the, no, there are no uh, organizations or uh, 
our uh, persons who are spared. Dalai Lama's office was hacked in 2009. Uh, back then, it wasn't ve a very sophisticated attack. It was, uh, um, but it still got into their systems and got uh, files and information out of them. While and, and today, where, uh, where uh, a journalist can be hacked just by uh, having a missed call on their WhatsApp. Think about that. A simple call, a missed call to their WhatsApp got them, got their phone hacked. That's, pretty so that's a pretty high level of sophistication, and it's almost imp impossible to protect yourself from that. And what I want to show here is that as activists, as NGOs, it, it is, uh, you, uh, we are also being targeted, and therefore we need to take this issue seriously and protect ourselves and the people who are working for. And one thing that's also quite hard when it comes to cybersecurity is it's not always obvious that you've been attacked, and it's sometimes not always obvious who did it, which makes the whole thing even more complex. But let's go into the basic protective measures that you can have. And I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible. Um, because I believe in simplicity, it's, um, and I think we humans, we tend to, yeah, I mean, let's face it, we are a lazy species. And therefore, I believe uh, that simple security and protective measures is the most effective ones. And I'm going to cover five aspects here. I'm going to cover uh, protective measures for your phone, something that almost every one of us have, your laptops or computers for that matter, network communication, your passwords or authentication, if you want to get extra nerdy, and last but not least, the human aspects, because we can be hacked too. We have just to face it. And uh, one thing that I want to um, emphasize here is that what's important here is not the protection of the devices themselves, but the protection of the information that can be accessed by these devices. And the in turn protection of the people, because we are protecting the people who are, we are working with or collaborating with. And uh, sometimes we, get, ha we have access to information that can be harmful to them. And that's what we want to avoid. So let's start with the first aspect here, which is the phone and how we protect that. And the first thing that I want to uh, um, raise here is text messaging, that is SMS, which is short message service. And why I advise against using it is because the phones work like this. You have your phone, and once you put a SIM card into it, it will connect to, a cellular, uh, to the cellular network. Uh, and that tower and your phone will have a connection which is encrypted. But once it leaves that tower to the, uh, to the, to the network of the uh, telecom operator, all of that information is in clear text. So it will be visible to the uh, telecommunication uh, uh, company what you've written, who you're communicating with, when, and from which tower. And thus, I would say uh, I advise against using SMS as a, as a way of communication. Uh, they are better and more um, and more protective ways to do that. And I usually recommend using Signal, an, an application where your communication is encrypted all the way from the moment it leaves your phone out, until it reaches the recipient's phone. Uh, and one, another thing, another thing uh, with Signal is that it's also it it scrambles who the sender is, so it's hard for someone who is snooping to see that you are communicating with that person. Something to keep in mind. Another thing when it comes to the phone is to consider when and where you're using your SIM card. Because as soon as you put in the SIM card into your phone, the phone will connect to this cellular tower. 
And this is, of course, something that's logged by the telecom company. Um, therefore, you should be aware of that. And if you want to uh, keep your, um, your movements um, secret, so to say, or confidential, uh, you should not use uh, the SIM card of your phone or use a prepaid SIM card, for that matter, and another type of phone, because your phone also has a unique fingerprint which is also communicated to this cellular tower. So be aware of that. Or if you want, you can just use the airplane mode so it does not connect um, to a cellular tower. We got a question here, of, uh, which is, do you recommend burner phones? And burner phones, they, to explain it to the viewers, is uh, they are, you know, the good old day Nokias, you know, quite dumb phones that can only text and uh, call, and that you can only text and call from. Um, let me put it this way. If you are afraid that the government or the police or the telecom company is snooping on your activities, then of course a burner phone with a prepaid SIM card is a good way to protect uh, you, that your movement and your communication. Um, so it really depends on your, on your, on your uh, threat level. As you can hear, it was not a clear recommendation for a burner phone because, again, it really depends on the situation. Uh, if you have some, uh, I, would st I would still recommend using Signal over using burner phones for the simple fact that when using the application Signal, you, doesn't, you don't reveal who you're communicating with. Next tip here is avoid unknown USB charging stations or use a USB condom. Now, USB condom is not something that you use for cyber sex. USB condom is actually, um, oh, let me, uh, let me put it this way. On our phones, we use the same port for charging uh, the phone and to connect the phone to a computer. And this is quite convenient, but it also puts us at risk when we connect our phone to a you know, these USB charging stations that are a little bit everywhere, because then the cable or that station, it ha can have data access to the phone itself. And in order to avoid that, my recommendation is either you use a USB condom, which is really an adapter that removes the data connectors from connecting with your phone so that only the power gets through or that you use a wall charger or your own wall charger, preferably. That's a way to recharge your phone and uh, without taking any, uh, any risks. I'm going to get back to phones in a moment uh, and change the subject to computers or laptops for that matter. And the same principle applies to computers as for, uh, as for phones, which is do not connect unknown USB sticks or gadgets. I'm going to tell you a, a short story here. 2010, a big cyber incident happened in Iran. In a, a nuclear power plant in uh, Natanz, I think the city was called, um, this power plant, it operates in uh, it's not connected to the internet or it's not connected to any other network outside of its internal network. Yet still, they had a massive cyber attack or rather a virus infection that could have caused a catastrophe. When, they, when the forensic team looked into this and uh, tried to uh, see what caused it, they realized that someone from the employees plugged in a USB stick and when the, when the employee did that, this USB stick activated a code on the machine and made it also spread to the other machines in this power plant. And probably this poor employee just found a USB stick lying on the parking lot and thought, ah, I wonder what this is. Go to their workstation and put it in and bang, and the, uh, the incident happened. And this is something that's, uh, of course, something that explo exploits our curiosity and something that you should be aware of uh, to, to keep everything, to, to avoid having unknown things plugged into your computer by the USB or any data port. 
Another thing is to make sure that both your operating system, maybe Windows, uh, most likely, and your antivirus, maybe Windows Defender, <laughs> is updated regularly. The reason for this is if you update your operating system, then all possible or all known security patches are uh, applied to your computer when you update it. So this makes your computer more secure by keeping it up to uh, by keeping it uh, in shape, so to say. And while we're talking Windows, I would also re I have a s here is a very clear and strong recommendation. Do not use any old Windows versions. So Windows 7, throw it out of the window. Windows 95, 98, throw them out of the window. You, if you are going to use Windows, you are stuck with Windows 10 because that's the only system that's still maintained and having security, uh, security patches applied to it. And since Windows have a, have a antivirus in it already that's called Windows Defender, then that's usually enough. Just keep it updated so it knows which viruses it can protect you against, and you will reduce your risk. Now, I'm not going to be, you know, pushing any moral, uh, moral be any moral, oh, moral police, it's called in Swedish, but I, I'm not going to put any, any values in this, but using pirated software is actually a very good, uh, re it's a good, very good way to get infected with malicious code. And uh, I would really advise people against getting or using pirated software for that reason. Uh, you don't know who the uh, person or the people or the group who issued the software is. Uh, you don't know if it has passed other hands that could have uh, put in malicious code in the software. So if you need software, try to avoid or rather, avoid pirated software. You can, uh, there is a lot of very good open source software that you could use instead. You also need to think about email attachments. And you're going to need to treat email attachments with caution. With caution. Uh, a lot of people who get infected by viruses are in fact, get infected uh, usually by, uh, the, uh, by the, uh, through Outlook or through emails. So if you get an email attachment or a link for that matter, do not open it, just to be safe. Now, the se next section, I'm going to talk about both computers and phones, because, you know, there's a lot of things that's similar between these two objects. They are both supercomputers and their own power, but in different shapes, more or less. And my first and foremost recommendation is encrypt your device. Whether you are using Mac, Linux, Windows, Android, or iOS, there is a functionality to encrypt your device. Use it. This uh, protects your information in the case, you, in the case of, you, of you losing your phone. Or for that matter, in case you're, you break your phone and you cannot boot it. What happens then? Well, then you can toss it away safely, knowing that your information is, is encrypted, and even if someone wants to extract that information, they couldn't. And uh, there, is, there is actually a move, not a movement, but a group of people who sits on eBay, and they buy used computers and used phones uh, that has been used in uh, you know, sensitive organizations in the hope that they can restore the information from their memory drives or hard drives. Usually when information is deleted, and I mean deleted even when the, um, when the trash can is emptied, it still resides in the file system and it can be recoverable. By encrypting your device, you avoid that problem. Next is to never let your device unattended. This means uh, both that you should lock your device when leaving, but also to have it next to you all the times when you are in high risk areas. Again, USB ports or data ports, they are a very vulnerable way into your device and you want to protect that at all times. Do not hoard apps. Apps are not Pokemons that should be collected. <laughs> 
And the reason why I advise against hoarding apps or installing a lot of apps is, uh, is, uh, is twofold. First, if you have an application on your phone or on your computer running, then you are taking a risk um, in that the provider of the application can have access to your information. Uh, we have uh, this ca case with TikTok that a lot of people probably know about by now that collects a lot of user data that it doesn't need to, but people give their, give their um, consent to the application just because they want to use it. And the less agreements you do, the less your information is spread out to other providers. The next reason is that every application has a vulnerability. That is a software, uh, a software, uh, um, so to say, a, f uh, a weak spot in their code that can be exploited by malicious actors. And by reducing the amount of applications we have, you reduce the potential risk of a particular application getting hacked, or rather, hacking your phone through the application. Again, keep your system and apps updated. It's the same principle that's, uh, that, as, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, whether it's Windows, whether our macOS or Android or iOS, keep them updated to avoid the software vulnerabilities. I would also advise you on backing up. And this is, of course, depending on what kind of information that you want protected. If you are working on a lot of documents that is going to take that, that's going to take a lot of uh, time until you that for you to collaborate on you're going to need to back that up in case you get hit with say ransomware or someone gets uh, uh, try to steal your hard drives from uh, from you then you can restore it with a backup now of course if you are communicating with someone and you want that and you don't need that information backed up then you don't need to think about it And last but not least, think of safely disposing your device at the end of the life cycle. Uh, that means that once you're done using your computer and you, once you're done using your phone, you cannot just drop it somewhere, both for environmental reasons, but also because, like I mentioned before, your information can be extracted. And you need to, in, uh, you need to ensure that the information is completely eradicated before you are before you stop using your device. And this can be done with, uh, there are several tools for that. Uh, I would advise people to seek uh, technical expertise in order to do that. I mentioned before about uh, open source, and the, that is uh, a concept in, in the software world that by using programs that are uh, being collaborated on by several people, hundreds, thousands of people, you are ensured that there are no special interests behind them and that there is also transparency in the code. And as you can see here, I'm mentioning a lot of uh, software here, Firefox, Thunderbird for uh, email, Veracrypt for encrypting and storing your uh, files, etc. is something I would recommend you to use. So look always for open source alternatives to the software you're using, both to ensure your safety and also you would save money in the process. Now let's talk a bit about network security. And this is a tricky part, but I'm going to try to keep it uh, to just a few pointers here. And the first thing is to never use an open Wi-Fi. Well, you know how it is when you go to a hotel lobby or cafe, usually you can just log into a, a Wi-Fi or you can connect to a Wi-Fi without even logging in. And that is a huge security risk in the sense that everything that you are sending can be seen by the network. And in order to avoid that, uh, you should be considering using a trustworthy VPN. Uh, VPN stands for virtu Virtual Private Network, and uh, there are usually companies selling their services uh, or their VPN services that uh, you should uh, consider. There are, of course, free VPNs, but you should be wary that if you are using a free VPN, you are, you are the product <laughs> or, or you, uh, that they are monetizing. Since all of your information 
is going to th going through one point, which is the VPN service, you really need to make sure that the company you're buying the service from is trustworthy. Besides the VPN, you can also consider using Tor. And Tor is useful, and it protects your anonymity as long as it's used correctly. Uh, you can use Tor through VPN. That is, you, ca you establish a VPN connection, and then you use Tor through that. And the benefit of that is that if there is some kind of surveillance against you, they, the surveiller would only see that you're connected to a VPN. And, you would, and they would have a hard time to understand what you're doing, since Tor is a very complicated uh, protocol to decipher. However, if you are using Tor, I would also advise you to be very wary of your private information. Uh, I, would, um, for uh, I would not use my normal logins, for example, to Facebook or to my email uh, over Tor. I would only use those who I n that I need to access uh, for a certain time for communi to communicate with uh, with certain people with, uh, uh, for sensitive topics. I realized that this was a very long and uh, complicated uh, uh, sentence, but to summarize it, be wary when you're using Tor, since it, it can be a great tool to circumvent um, censorship, but, all, but, you're, but you don't know where your data and uh, which nodes your data pass through when using Tor. One another thing here is to keep in mind to disconnect and turn off your critical devices while not in use, because a lot of of, of your devices are usually connected to the network even if you, uh, when even when they are in suspend mode, they wake up, connect somewhere, check for updates or maybe if they ha if you have uh, new emails, and if you are being target, targeted by, uh, by an attack or want to reduce your, uh, your uh, target surface, turn these devices off. Because if there is no device present on the network, then, of course, it cannot be attacked. And this is something to uh, good to keep in mind of, uh, that, uh, which is a lot of what you do is visible to the network. Say, for example, that you are sitting in this cafe and you're connected to their open Wi-Fi. If you are visiting a website through normal HTTP protocol, then that information is, ups, is very visible to whoever owns the network. If you would access information over a secure connection or encrypted connection, HTTPS, for example, then whoever owns that uh, network cannot see the contents of that information, but they still see that you are connected uh, to a certain website. Unless, again, that you, unless you're using VPN. So this, uh, so this is something to keep in mind that so sometimes you can, con that you, you can keep your information confidential and secret, but who you are communicating with can be still visible. Now let's go through pass, pass, uh, passwords. That's not passports. Passwords. <laughs> passwords is uh, a, is a subject that um, that cause a lot of trouble because we human beings we are not made to remember passwords. Yet we are expected to remember a lot of passwords wherever we log in. And I'm going to give you a few. Um, uh, a few advice here to uh, to make your password complicated life a little bit easier and vastly more secure. First off, I would advise you to use biometric login whenever you can. Most of you have biometric login to your phone, which is good. Use it. Uh, and why advise you to use it? Because it is, first off, easier to remember. Second, you're not revealing your PIN code to snooping people or to potential CCTV cameras. So in this sense, the, your phone is, is, or your login is bound to you biologically, more or less. 
So use biometrics whenever you can. Second advice is using a password manager. Now, I imagine all of you have a, may probably a Facebook account, a email account somewhere, maybe an Instagram account, an account to the soccer team, and that's just five examples, maybe four, maybe five. Not good at counting. And I can bet that you have at least uh, tenfold more passwords that you are using to, uh, to uh, access your information in different websites. Since we humans are not very good at remembering passwords, we tend to reuse the same password. Which is not good, uh, because when websites get hacked, these, uh, they can lose their, uh, their, not, uh, their databases containing their usernames and their passwords. And if this information is dumped, dumped somewhere, then hackers could easily try to guess uh, your login information in different websites by using your email address and your password. Password managers make this easier since they take care of, your, uh, of remembering passwords for you. You can create a unique password for different websites. Uh, and instead of remembering a lot of passwords, you just need to remember one password. And of course, this makes it much more vulnerable, this service that you're using. But you can choose to use uh, the, uh, service of, uh, this kind of service from a trustworthy provider or to use a password manager that is offline. Um, I usually recommend two password managers, which is KeePass and Bitwarden. Both of these are open source software and, uh, and are pretty secure. Granted that you are uh, using them correctly. Next advice is keeping an eye on breaches. Like I said, there are a lot of uh, databases get hacked and these uh, usernames and passwords get stumped somewhere. And I would so advise you to register to uh, services such as have I been pawned or Firefox Monitor? Because what happens is, in case your login name uh, is, uh, um, um, is found in one of these, in, in a breach, whether it's a new uh, uh, or old, you get notified so that you can change your password in that service and keep your information protected. The last advice for, uh, for passwords is using multi-factor authentication. And uh, this is uh, something that makes it, when the, it goes like this. Say that you are that you're going to log into your email account, you write your username, you write your password, but then you're going to need a third way of authenticating yourself. Usually, it is a code provided by an application. Sometimes, it is a code provided by an SMS. I would advise using a service or an application that provides you uh, as, um, this second authentication and avoid the text messages because there has been a lot of incidents where people lose access to the SIM cards uh, since telecom companies are tricked into providing SIM cards to malicious actors. I'm going to give you an example of websites that uses multi-factor authentication, and some of them are Google, Facebook, uh, Bitwarden, LastPass, two password managers, Outlook. This is just, uh, and also Dropbox, and this is just a handful of services that provide multi-factor authentication. And if you are using any of them, or anything that deals with sensitive in information, have multi-factor authentication enabled. Now, let's talk to the last but uh, most important aspect, the human, the human beings. Uh, today, security technology has become so sophisticated that it is 
usually much easier manipulating and hacking human beings than hacking the systems themselves. And in this, uh, this is why it's also important to focus on this aspect. And the first thing that I would like uh, to advise you to is to have some kind of phishing training or anti-phishing training rather, uh, which, uh, this, uh, which uh, will provide you or rather equip you with a tool set and knowledge to recognize when malicious emails, malicious links or malicious redirects appear in your device so you don't accidentally click on them or run malicious codes to, that will affect your computer or phone. The next, the next aspect, and this is really a, a privacy uh, issue, but it's still important, and that is to not reveal time-sensitive information on social media. If you are, for example, uh, uh, wanting to hide your, uh, your movements, then you, want, you don't want to post that on social media. And if you want to inform about something that you or that your group or organization has, have done, um, maybe it's sometimes it's good to do that after a while in order to reduce the risk or reduce the possibilities of you and your peers to be associated with a certain event. Next advice is to keep a cool head and don't get rushed. Why this is uh, uh, why I'm advising for this is the, is uh, that people who are going to manipulate you, you know, the human hackers, they will usually try to pretend to be someone, and they will try to be someone with authority, and they will ask you to do something in a rush. And of course, what happens when we are asked to do some things by authoritarian people when we are stressed out? We tend to not think. <laughs> and this is the why I would advise you and urge you, one, if you get uh, someone or, uh, that would urge you to do something over an email or some kind of message, maybe by Facebook, keep a cool head, think critically and think of this if it is a feasible request the person is making before you actually act on it. Lastly, I want to ask you to be aware because there are so, there, it is incredibly hard to know if your device that is computer or whether it's a, whether it's a computer or a phone uh, have been infected by malicious code, but there are some signals that can tell you if you have been. And that is if your device is, is unusually slow, doesn't have to be malicious code, but could be a, sign, a sign of it. If you notice note that your application or that your system is crashing more than usual, again, doesn't have to be malicious code, but could be. There has uh, there ha there is <laughs> a lot of a lot of a lot of examples where people or that is or other hackers with bad coding skills write trojans and install them and they these trojans cause systems to crash and lastly be aware if your if your if your web browser is doing a quick and unusual redirect that is when you're at trying to get into a website but you get redirected to another website and then back to the normal website that could be also a sign of an attack. And in those cases, you need to seek someone who is techni technically uh, knowledgeable about this area to go through your devices. Now, I said I would do a, a, a short introduction about threat modeling, and I will um, do that very quickly now uh, and open up for potential uh, questions from the audience. Otherwise, uh, we will, is, we will uh, stop it in approximately five minutes. Threat modeling is something, is a tool that makes, you, makes it easier for you to know what threats that you are exposed to. And, um, and, you are, and, you go, and you get to know that by, going by asking yourself, basically, a few questions. The first question is, what is it that I need to protect? And this 
on the objects that needs protection is usually not only the phone not or the computer it usually is something more <laughs> abstract than that could be communication with my peers could be a document that you are collaborating on that you will release um, th that which is something that's very common with inve investigating journalists so you all you should always think about the object that you want, the, the information object that you want to protect, rather than the devices that can access it. Then you should also think about what, what, uh, what, uh, what are you, who is it that you're tr trying to protect your object from, or what? The what could actually be that, it, uh, that you are worried about if you are running, for example, a file server, then you maybe want, want to protect it from not only burglars, but also from natural disasters. Floodings or lightning strikes could occur and knock your file server unrendable. But, but, but you also need to think that if it is people that uh, you are worried about that could target you or your group or organization, then you need to think about what is their motivation. What are they after? What's, dr what's driving them? But also what their capabilities and resources are. Is it someone who is very angry but <laughs> doesn't have the technical know-how? Or is it someone who is, do, who is doing this for a job and has a lot of resources at their disposal? Maybe a whole team. That's not something that's um, common uh, for countries and for well-organized cybercriminal laws uh, uh, to be. That is, having a lot of resources and a, lot of, and a big team uh, to aid them in their remission. And once you have done that, then you will need to make an educated guess of how high the risk is. Uh, if it is a flooding that you are uh, worried about, then you need to think of how often does the, a flooding occur. If it is someone that you are worried about, whether it's cyber criminals, maybe alt-right groups that you want to protect yourself, then you need to see how, how, is the pos how big is the possibility that, a th that the threat or an attack could materialize. And then think of how serious are the consequences of the threat, or i.e. the attack, how serious the consequences would be if that would materialize. A flooding could cause computer damage or that you lose access to your files but if you would be exposed to violent groups then we are talking about lives at stake here last but not least you need to think about the measures you need to take in order to protect the information considering the threat uh, that uh, that are posed and the the potential uh, the, uh, the potential risk of the threat materializing I am uh, not going to uh, talk more about this uh, threat modeling, uh, but I will point you to more resources where you can read more about these kind of um, uh, things and also read more about threat modeling in general if you want. Uh, these are some resources that I strongly recommend. The first one is EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a very reputable source, and uh, they have a very good handbook for pride uh, activists that you can uh, uh, look into and uh, get more advice from. It's called resources, Pride Resources for Activism in di Digital and Physical Spaces. Go read it. it it's quite good. And you also have, um, uh, you have also accessnow.org, which is a voluntarily 24-7 helpline for activists in case they get uh, attacked and uh, have some kind of um, um, inc cyber incident, then they could uh, be a, f a source of help. Securitywithoutborders.org has a collection of very good resources where you can educate yourself about anti-phishing training, for example, but also where you can read on reports of what's going on in the cyber security field. That's an activist, of course, uh, or an NGO. And you also have privacytools.io, which has a list of good and usually and uh, open source software that is trustworthy. 
Last but not least is also a network called riseup.net. And uh, this is an, a network of activists that has a plethora of digital resources for other activists. Um, you can also check them out both to use their resources, but also for further reading, because they have also pretty a lot of good uh, uh, guides. Now, I want to say thank you to everybody who have been watching. Um, I hope this has been uh, of uh, some use. And if you have any follow-up questions or if you want to be uh, to stay in touch with me, you are very welcome to do so. You can find me on these uh, channels. I have uh, uh, I have LinkedIn, but also Mastodon. Uh, and of course, you can email me at khalid.rashid at pm.me. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.